Welcome back to Semper Gumby for the long-awaited after-action question and answer session where we're going to take a good long look at where it all went wrong. It's been a while since we played the game and now that this is settled, looking back it doesn't feel like I did as bad a job as I thought I did. Obviously I failed the criteria that matters most because I lost. But a bit of number crunching shows that both Halloween's Germans and my Marines came out of this in tatters. I took about 75% casualties, but Halloween took about 61%, which is a significant chunk of his force, especially given that at this scale the attacker has 165% of the defender's points to spend. So it feels a bit less like my unfortunate pixel trip and were doomed from the start, and more like it was me screwing up somewhere that made the difference. Naturally, I have my own theories about where it all went wrong, but I think you guys have done a pretty good job of covering the bases here with all your questions. There is a fair bit of overlap. A lot of people have seen the same things and a lot of the answers are going to interrelate with one of each other. But we can kick off with the questions about force selection. First up, we have Oblivious Penguin who asks, how did he have more troops at a higher quality than yours on top of four main battle tanks? There are two sides to this. Firstly, Halloween had more points to spend because in this battle he was the attacker and I had less because I was the defender. This is simply an exercise in game balance that echoes real life conditions. Not only is attacking generally more costly than defending, because the attacker has to move forward and expose himself while the defender can remain unseen, but because of this, combatants tend to only attack when they have the kind of advantage that would make success more likely. This is something you can mess with in the quick battle setup menu, but we went with standard values which gave Halloween uh, 10,300 points to attack with, against my 6,220 points. Personally, I don't think that ratio gives the attacker that much of an advantage. I think it does a pretty good job of evening things out, given the natural advantages of the defender. Secondly, and a little more interestingly, is the question of quality. The difference in experience between the Marines and the Germans was something that a lot of people picked up on. And I think something that I bumped up against here was a kind of default state of mind that I have in regards to combat mission, I play a lot more meeting engagements than I play attack defend battles and because in meeting engagements both sides have the same number of points, I'm used to sticking to regular experience. This means that if my opponent goes for the quantity approach and brings a lot of cheap conscript troops, then I'll outclass him in experience. And if my opponent takes the quality route and brings a smaller more experienced force, then I'll outnumber him. But this battle was an attack defend and Halloween had more points to spend than me so he was able to get a force that was qualitatively better and quantitatively larger. So yeah, well done brain. It's not just not something that I really contemplated or if I did I disregarded it, which was smart. This leads us fairly neatly onto Lastly's first question, which was, do I feel like having my troops being at a higher quality would have helped to change the outcome significantly? No, not significantly. I think that the kind of things that experience seems to help with, so spotting ability, aim, suppression resistance, stuff like that, are less important than external top-down factors like positioning and mutual support. Or, in other words, while better quality pixel trippant might have gotten more kills or perhaps hung on for a little longer, I don't think they would have been able to pull me out of the tactical mess that I made myself in this battle. For example, that marine squad I sent forward on the right at the start would probably die just as fast and with just as little impact if they were elite, because they were alone and unsupported fighting against an enemy who had the strength and room to manoeuvre that allowed him to win fire superiority very quickly. Other factors, like prompt and accurate artillery support, to give a totally non-random example, would have made much, much more of a difference. Along the same lines, Mason M asks, at the beginning of the series, you said you made a sacrifice of quality of the Marines for more bodies. Do you think it would have turned out different with a smaller but more experienced force? In short, yes, I think it would have turned out different. I think Halloween would probably have won a lot faster if I'd had a smaller, more experienced force. Firstly, because he would have had fewer pixel trapping to kill, which is a non-trivial point, because at the end of the day, experience levels don't magically make troops tougher. They all become casualties when they get shot. 
And secondly, a smaller force would have to be spread a lot thinner across the map to cover the same amount of space. So at the pointy end, they would have been even more vulnerable to being locally outnumbered and outgunned, which means they're probably going to get pinned down and picked off even faster. So overall, I don't think that making my Marines veteran or improving the soft factors in other ways would have been a good investment. If anything, by the end of the game, with all of the things being equal, I think I would rather have had more troops. A fresh, full-strength platoon at the end of the game could easily have made all the difference, especially if it was coming in the park on the right and could have stopped Halloween from advancing across it to take the Southwest Roads objective, in the same way that the platoon on the left stopped the Germans from getting into the West Roads. The obvious lead-on from that is to look at what I actually brought and see if I wasted points. Was there anything I brought along that simply failed to perform? Not because I handled it poorly, uh, we'll be getting to that, but because it was just a bad pick. Two things really stand out. Firstly, we've got the mines. Every now and again I forget how crap mines are in quick battles and bring them along. So just to make things clear to you guys and to my future self if I ever end up watching this again, don't take mines. They're simply not worth it. I spent 280 points on four anti-vehicle little minefields and between them they destroyed a single 92 point weasel that was unlucky enough to happen to drive over them. 280 points is about half a marine rifle platoon and I know what I'd rather have. This is a lot more obvious in hindsight, it's a long time ago now, but I do vaguely remember thinking of them as insurance against something like a mechanised infantry rush. That's not necessarily a bad idea, but half a rifle platoon could probably do that job better anyway and be repositioned as the situation dictated in a much more useful way than static mines. The second element I would definitely have left behind is the mortar support, which a few of you definitely picked up on. Mortars do have some advantages over artillery. They're faster to call in, they have a faster rate of fire, a steeper trajectory, which is useful in an urban environment, and these mortars in particular had more ammunition. But in this battle, 81mm simply wasn't a beefy enough size of mortar bomb. Against unarmoured Syrian infantry out in the open? they would have been devastating. Against armoured Gebirgsjäger in a dense urban environment, not so much, and while the mortars did get a few kills here and there, they certainly didn't make back their combined cost of 600 points. I cast them as less of an absolute mistake than the mines, but if I'd been sensible enough to actually test them beforehand, I might have figured out that they weren't going to be as effective as I thought they were going to be. Taking out the 81s has the additional benefit of making both the Mortar Platoon HQ and Weapon Company HQ redundant, which means I can free up even more points, meaning that with the mines gone too, I would have had about an extra thousand points to spend. This would have been enough to squeeze in another Company HQ and that fourth rifle platoon, so without changing anything else, I would have had a fairly chunky reserve complete with javelins and forward observers hanging around at the back waiting to interject in the end game. So that's probably the minimum tweaking I would do to my force to improve it. It's bigger and there's more effective and flexible firepower. Some of you guys have asked about other possible changes. The ghost of Pavlik Morozov asks, if I had to do it all over again, would I rather take veterancy or armor? And along similar lines, Paul Beeves asks whether I regret not having the flexibility of a tank pair tucked away in reserve to counterattack especially in the later stages when Halloween had very little armour. I actually originally started out with a very aggressive armour-based plan. What I wanted to do was bring two Abrams platoons and punch them up on the left and right on turn one to trap Halloween in his setup zone. One of the reasons I didn't go with this is because I felt like a tank-heavy force was going to be a lot more fragile than an infantry-heavy force. That might sound a little backwards because tanks are much harder to kill, but in practice a marine infantry platoon is 52 individual targets compared to the four targets in an Abrams platoon. Each tank is a concentrated chunk of combat power, so losing a marine fire team is a lot less of a big issue than losing an Abrams, and despite the tanks being heavily armoured, they're by no means invincible. Halloween had definitely demonstrated in our previous game that he could handle his own tanks very well, which would have made them a serious threat, and in the event he brought along a pair of tornadoes with eight laser-guided bombs between them that would have decimated any tank force I brought along. 
So to the ghost of Pavlik Morozov, if I had to choose between veterancy or armor, I would probably pick veterancy in this case, though I'd always be on the lookout for a third option of more pixel tripping. And to Paul Beeves, a pair of Abrams at the end would have been really useful and would have given me a lot more flexibility, but I don't think they would have survived that long given the Luftwaffe was flying around overhead. One final tank-related question from Bright Wizard 12. Do I feel my opponent made a mistake bringing the Leopard 2s, or do I feel that MBTs have a place in modern urban situations and that my opponent just misused or underutilized them? I don't think that taking the Leopards was a mistake. I don't think I would have handled them in the same way that Halloween did, and they are very vulnerable in certain circumstances, but they absolutely have a place in modern urban warfare. You just have to compare the way that the Russians used their armor in Grozny in the 90s with the ways that the US Marines used their armor in Fallujah in 2004 to see that tanks and infantry fighting vehicles can be both extremely vulnerable and extremely effective depending on the situation, the enemy, and the way that they used. For this battle in particular, I actually think that motorsport auctions hit the nail on the head when he commented about the psychological element of the leopards. As soon as the drone picked up the panzers, I was watching them every turn to see what Halloween was going to do with them, and assumed that he was going to commit his leopards as his main effort, rather than focusing on his infantry, which actually turned out to be a much bigger threat. This is actually a good opportunity to point out that I did consciously tailor my force to kind of counterpick Halloween's choices. In our first game, I brought a tank-heavy force backed up by air power, so here I went in a completely different direction with an infantry artillery force to mix things up a bit. The hope was that Halloween would look at my first game and bring some counterpicks along that would help him deal with a load of Abrams and Cobras. You end up with a bit of convoluted logic. I brought this, so he's probably going to bring this, so I'm going to bring something else so that what he brings is wasted. But the end result is that there were three Stinger teams that sat in the German deployment zone all battle and contributed nothing. So that's about 200 wasted points because they had nothing to shoot at. And then the Tornadoes pretty much found two Humvees to drop bombs on and weren't very effective. Together they cost maybe 1500 points minimum, which is a pretty significant 14 to 15 percent of the Germans total points budget. Obviously I didn't know that Halloween would bring some air support along, but if he had brought, for example, Milan ATGM teams or other anti-tank focused picks, then they would have been equally less effective and less efficient picks than they would have been if I'd brought tanks along for them to shoot at. A few more questions on force selection before we move on to the tactical stuff. Robert Haddow asks whether I feel like the Marines ultimately lacked in direct firepower to which I would say I don't think there's anything wrong with the Marines' direct firepower, but I do think there was something wrong in the way I used it. All those M16A4s with ACOGs in a Marine squad are probably a lot better engaging at a couple of hundred meters than they are at close range, which was something that seems very obvious in hindsight, but I didn't really pick up on it at the time. In a similar vein, Agostino Ventura asks what I think about the effectiveness or lack thereof of fire support elements like MMGs, GMGs or small teams. Uh, so in order, machine gun teams are always a bit underwhelming because it's difficult not to conceptualize them as killing machines mowing down hundreds of enemy troops when actually they don't really work like that. MMGs are all about suppression and the way things panned out in this battle I think that none of the MMGs could really get a lot of that done. Whether that was because the engagements were too close range or too quick or because Halloween was moving up in such force that the MGs always had too many targets to suppress at any one time so they were vulnerable to getting suppressed themselves after which it's a slippery slope to destruction. I didn't bring any GMGs, mostly because something like a 40mm grenade launcher needs a lot of feeding and infantry GMG teams simply don't carry what I would consider to be a useful amount of ammunition. You've probably got like two belts and that, that's it, then they're just infantry again. The Humvee mounted GMGs are a different story and they could perhaps have been useful, assuming of course that Halloween's air support didn't vaporize them in the first five minutes. On the German side, each Gebirgsjäger platoon actually has a GMG team in its table of equipment and organization, and Holloway did get some opportunities to use them. I'm not sure if they were massively effective in the bigger picture, but I, I definitely noticed when they were shooting at me. 
small teams are slightly different. In the anti-infantry role, they suffered from the same problems the MMGs did in this battle, but they were also there to perform a kind of medium anti-tank role between the rifle squad, disposable AT, and the javelins. Given that there weren't very many armor targets out there for the shoot at, and one of the leopards was knocked out by a small team, I'd say they were definitely effective enough, definitely worth having. And finally, on the force selection front, another one from Mason M, who asks, would I rather have had a Marine Scout Recon Platoon because they have M4A1s and a laser designator? I'm not sure it would have made all that much difference at the pointy end. There's an argument that the Germans were able to put out more lead at close quarters because their G36s were fully automatic, and all the Marine riflemen had M16A4s, which are restricted to single shot and burst. The M4A1 has a shorter barrel but a fully automatic capability, but Given how many kills the actual snipers piled up with their Mark 82s and the potential to damage light vehicles with that Mark 11 Ralphos round, I think I'd rather have the scout snipers than the recon guys. The laser designator is a little different because it does allow the use of precision artillery, but firstly, only the recon platoon HQ actually has one, so it's not that big a deal. And secondly, I don't really think I had that many opportunities to actually use precision artillery. Hollering didn't really hang around very much, he was moving up quite fast, and while there were some fairly static targets out there, given the nature of his force, they were almost all infantry, and it feels like a bit of a waste to drop just two precision shells onto a building, when I could, and should, have been pasting whole swathes of the map. That's the force selection stuff out of the way, then what about the tactics? There are really two components to this. The way I used my artillery and the way I deployed and handled my infantry. And you guys have plenty of questions and comments about both. Agostino Ventura also asks for some thoughts on the effectiveness of the harassing artillery concept. So the idea behind this is to use artillery as a means of disrupting and slowing down the enemy by putting a slow barrage in his way or in his reinforcement route that is dangerous enough to cause the enemy to either divert around it or stop completely but without using up too much artillery ammunition in the process. And this really didn't work very well. Firstly, in a similar way to the 81mm mortars, the 155s were not as effective as I thought they were going to be. The combination of lots of buildings and German body armor proved to be pretty good at keeping Halloween's casualties down. I think there was even one instance in one of the blue four turns when you can see a 155 shell score a direct hit on a building full of Kabergsig and the only thing that happened was one of them got lightly wounded and just carried on. Heavier, more intense barrages, like the ones I was finally starting to drop towards the end and the one that Halloween dumped on my left-hand platoon, were much, much more effective. Secondly, the concept of stopping or diverting the enemy with an artillery obstacle requires the enemy's consent. It's about convincing the enemy to react in the way you want to, whether that's stopping to avoid casualties or wasting time and effort by bypassing the danger area. And if it's not doing enough damage to convince the enemy to react, then, well, it's obviously useless. The fact that the artillery was too dilute to do much damage was also compounded by the way that Halloween was handling its infantry. We're going to be coming back to this in a little while, but I naturally, if erroneously, assumed that Halloween would act how I would act. So I was assuming that the German infantry would be well split out, split down into lots of little teams, and would therefore take quite a long time to transit through uh, areas of the map. What Halloween actually did was he had a platoon or two up in front in strength with a couple of scouts not too far ahead. So if I started dropping artillery behind him, well, it didn't make much difference because he didn't appear at least to be feeding in that many reinforcements. And if I dropped artillery directly on top, the rate of fire was so slow he had time to simply move out of the way. In both of these circumstances, a few 155 rounds a minute aren't going to convince him to do what I want. So. So in these circumstances against this particular opponent, the harassing artillery concept was not very effective at all. Mohammed Siami, I think, has a very good point. It's his opinion that I was indecisive in my use of artillery, and the constant changing of target areas at the start killed me. And I can agree with that. Uh, again, I think there are a few reasons for this. Number one is that I actually found it a lot more difficult to call in artillery than I was expecting. 
it's an urban map and line of sight is frequently fragmented and restricted, meaning that it felt a lot like my FOs, even the one using the drone, weren't picking up on incoming spotting rounds. So particularly trying to call artillery in on the right towards the start and trying to call mortars in on the enemy transiting along the top map edge, I felt like the spotting phase was simply taking too long. I think in both cases the spotting rounds were consistently falling off the edge of the map and simply weren't being adjusted towards where I wanted them to fall. When that sort of thing starts happening it can quickly become a question of is this working but just really slowly or is this a waste of time and I tried to solve it by cancelling and trying again somewhere else which obviously just made it worse. Number two again we have the enemy actor influence. Halloween was moving fast enough to compound my frustration with the slow, apparently not working spotting phases. And finally, number three is the influence of the target reference points. These might be an unexpected candidate for making me indecisive with my artillery because TRPs let you call in fire missions when you don't have line of sight and you can bypass the spotting phase entirely. The gunners already have the data they need so they just put the rumbas in and blaze away. So by using the TRPs, I could get artillery on target much quicker, and in theory, with less time wasted. The problem as events panned out is that it made me wait. So instead of dropping artillery when and where it was needed, I kind of ended up waiting for hollowing to get close to the TRPs so I could be more efficient. And of course, it had the opposite effect because it was making me cancel fire missions and act reactively instead of proactively. So very much a case of perfect is the enemy if good enough there. Finally, on the artillery front, Grey Fox Gaming asks, do I regret not dropping mortars slash artillery on the enemy infantry platoons moving in the open in the earlier turns? Yes, I do regret that. I regret that a lot. That would have made a huge difference, not just in causing casualties, but in slowing down Halloween's advance onto my left. I didn't do this partly because of the problems with frustrating spotting, as I just talked about. I was definitely trying to call in mortars on that route at one point, and it just wasn't working. But another important element is this bizarre concept of fair play. I think I remember saying something along the lines of, oh, it wouldn't be very sportsmanlike to not let him out of his setup zone, which is a lot more admirable than it is sensible. I have no idea why I was so stupid as to think like that. Uh, so yeah, bit of a head scratcher that one. Moving on to the infantry and for this one, uh, Luftwaffel really hit the nail on the head. I won't read the whole thing out because it's a pretty long post, but I, I think it's on the money. Fundamentally, I went into this battle with a big pile of assumptions and then didn't change what I was doing to adapt to reality as those assumptions all turned out to be false. So let's take that example of the forward squad on the far right and list them all off again. So one, when the enemy turns up, the marines will spot and engage them first. Wrong. Two, Halloween is going to be cautiously feeling his way forward so he won't appear in strength. Wrong. Three. A 13-man marine rifle squad has enough firepower at close range to hold out for a little while at least. Wrong. Four. I'll be able to call in artillery support using the drone very quickly. Wrong. Five. The squad will be able to disengage and fall back before Halloween brings overwhelming force to bear. Wrong. Six. The rest of the platoon might take a morale hit if that forward squad is lost, but it won't be a big deal. Totally wrong. There's probably more, but you get the idea. What I was planning for and what I deployed to try and achieve was a kind of tar pit strategy. Against this background subconscious mindset that I would somehow have more men, again, totally wrong, what I wanted to do was slow Halloween down with lots of small teams, cause a steady dribble of casualties, and pummel him with artillery. Driving this, which Luftwaffle also points out, is this idea that if I present something like a strong point position, if I have a significant force in one area, then after the ambush has been sprung and the initial casualties have been exchanged, Halloween will simply destroy that position with artillery. Which, of course, is exactly what happened to my left hand platoon, because despite consciously trying to avoid strong pointing, I went and did it anyway. Well done, me. Staging ambushes and falling back is a way to avoid this, but it does come with the caveats that disengaging is not an easy battlefield action to pull off, and there are not a lot of areas on this particular map that have both a good field of fire to the front and a secure escape route to somewhere else that's useful in the rear. 
Another factor to bear in mind is that this kind of shoot and scoot stuff is obviously much easier than pull off against a fundamentally foot mobile opponent. And I didn't know I was going to be up against an infantry heavy force while I was deploying. I didn't know what Halloween had brought along until I got the drone over his deployment zone. A mechanized infantry force with a lot more speed to it would be much, much more difficult to get away from. Not only because it would have had more firepower, making it easier for me to lose fire superiority, but because all it takes is one marder getting a line on my fallback route to effectively shut it off with 20mm cannon fire. In a lot of ways my deployment was better suited to dealing with an armour vehicle heavy enemy with a lot of direct and indirect fire at its disposal than it was suited to dealing with an infantry heavy force that could get itself forward in strength into all the buildings, which I think showed in the event. The leopards didn't last very long when they were committed, but the German infantry was a significant problem all the way through the game. Again, because I've had all these assumptions that were just wrong. Voak asks if I feel I was a bit timid with the target arcs. Target arcs are always a bit of a trade-off, but in this case I think I was, perhaps in some cases, a lot more worried about what Halloween might do to my pixel truppen than I was thinking about what I could be doing to his. So, for example, on the left I only had a few teams in the big apartment blocks and they pretty much held their fire on short target arcs and just watched the enemy walking around. There is an argument to holding fire and just observing the enemy without giving your position away, but I think I was a little bit too focused on trying to be clever by watching what was going on and backplotting Halloween's force selection. Imagine how different the game would have been if I'd had even a couple of marine rifle squads engaging those Gebirgsjäger platoons transiting across the top map edge. 30 or so marines with 4 times ACOG scopes on M16A4s firing on enemy infantry in the open at a couple of hundred meters feels, in hindsight, like a good engagement for the marines and a bad one for the Germans, but I was much too worried about that position getting pasted by leopards or marders or GMGs or artillery or whatever to actually exploit its potential. So, so yeah, while it was sensible to keep target arcs on, keep observing and avoid giving my positions away in some cases, I was probably too timid with them overall, yeah. Another one from Lastley. How much do I feel the terrain impacted my different units' ability to mutually support one another? A lot. This wasn't helped by some errors on my side, like the whole tar pit strategy deployment that kind of encourages me to spread out, but I can't put enough emphasis on the fact that Halloween's infantry handling was so much better than mine in general. The terrain of course is a significant factor and obviously uh, lots of restricted sight lines and things that make mutual support difficult, but Halloween was consistently able to bring more squads into the fight than I was expecting and like you say, made effective use of smoke and manoeuvre to create engagements where he had a significant advantage. One thing this battle has really shown me is that I definitely need to improve the way I use infantry in the modern titles. Evil Twin has a burst of questions I haven't quite covered that I'll quickly paraphrase and go through. Do I think that 120mm mortars might have been more effective in an urban area? Possibly, but they seem like a kind of half measure between 81s and 155s. Would a US Army formation with smaller squads but more platoons have allowed for more artillery morale shock resistance? That's entirely possible. In fact, I think there's a strong argument uh, for the converse, that the Marine platoons were so big that I clumped them up more than I would have done with Army platoons, making them more vulnerable to artillery in the first place. Do I think that friendly engineers might have made a significant difference by knocking down certain walls to make the enemy more vulnerable as they enter buildings? Maybe. The downside to doing things like that is that the enemy can see when you blast holes in things, so if he sees the backs of a load of buildings getting blown out then he'll probably be able to work out what's going on and take measures to mitigate or avoid the problem. Uh, last of all, do I think my snipers were effective? Some of them were very effective, especially on that left flank towards the beginning. Others achieved absolutely nothing. Amusingly, I brought the 50 caliber Mark 82 Barretts along to deal with light vehicles and the only sniper team that actually did any vehicle damage took a weasel out with a M203 HEDP grenade. So, hmm, yeah. 
I, I think the key with the sniper is, is getting them into positions where they can engage at medium rather than long ranges. And not to forget that uh, if you are taking them, it's usually pretty cheap to bump them up to elite experience, which makes a significant difference. Finally, to round things out, you guys had a couple of questions regarding what I thought about Halloween's handling of the battle. Richard King asks whether I think, or if Halloween thinks, that he used his close air support too early. I think that sending the uh, air in immediately is entirely sensible. If I'd had had some tanks hanging around, obviously the earlier they're knocked out, the better it would have been for Halloween. I would say that there is perhaps a role for air power later in the battle. For example, once you force the enemy to maneuver, it could be effective to catch him in the open with air support, especially if he's not seen any up until that point and he's not expecting it. But again, getting the aircraft on the job at the start of the battle means that you're more likely to destroy enemy assets before they've had a chance to do any damage. Baron asks a slightly more delicate question. What do I think my opponent's biggest mistakes were? How would I evaluate his gameplay at the micro, i.e. commands given, complexity of command sequences, timing of commands, etc., and macro levels for selection tactics and deployment of assets in terms of time and space? Obviously, that's a lot of stuff. and I'm not really in a position to comment on some of it because... Even with the blue four turns, I can't see the actual orders given. I can only see them as they're carried out. Probably the best method of judging this is to look for mistakes, and I don't think that Halloween made very many. The force selection was on the ball. Lots of infantry, plenty of engineers. I like the idea of the weasels, even if they didn't really get a chance to shine. The two tornadoes would have been extremely effective had I brought a similar force to the one I brought in our previous battle. The leopards were also a good choice, and although they all went down, and I don't think I would have used them like that, it's important to remember that Halloween brought them up to support his infantry as they crossed a danger area of essentially unknown risk, and he brought them all up at the same time for maximum impact and maximum support. Luckily for me, I was ready for them, but if I hadn't have been, things could have gone sideways extremely quickly or even more quickly. Halloween's use of smoke was particularly good and actually caught me off guard a bit. I tend to overlook artillery and infantry smoke in shock force, possibly because I'm too used to playing Black Sea where there are a lot more thermal optics around and smoke is generally a bit less useful and it was a bit of a pain to deal with here. I used it very well. Uh, he made a couple of pathfinding errors here and there, uh, most noticeably with the leopards, the one that uh, almost got stuck in the marsh and the ones crossing the road uh, but that's par for the course uh, these things happen especially when it's a long game and there's lots of orders flying around as for biggest mistake i think going straight for the punch on my left hand objective was a bit reckless he lost a platoon or so of infantry, maybe two, I can't remember, and all four leopards there, which might not have happened if he'd taken it slower. But on the flip side, doing that uncovered my platoon in that objective, which he was able to neutralize with artillery, and he was pretty successful in drawing my attention to that flank. Although the push on my right into the other objective that really put the nail in the coffin wasn't perfectly kind of synchronized with it, I definitely reacted to the threat on my left, in a way that left my right uncovered. Uh, so Halloween was definitely able to exploit that. So to round this uh, question and answer video out, at the end of the day here, what I had was an inappropriate plan based on a bucket full of false assumptions leading to an inflexible deployment that railroaded me into playing in a very non-reactive passive way. It's a screw up. This happens from time to time. Sometimes you make choices that seem like a good idea and then you look back at them later and wonder what the hell you were thinking. So going back over games and trying to work out what went wrong is really important. Every now and again, it's important to be taken down a notch so that you can learn or relearn things that are gonna make you bounce back better. And for exactly that reason, I, I'm not gonna hold back from sharing interesting games with you guys um, on the channel just because I lose. This was a very good game. The most important part is that almost 
all of the mistakes I made in this were because I made assumptions that turned out to be wrong. What I could have done is gone into the game and tested this stuff out by playing some quick battles with both sides, but I didn't because I thought I had it nailed down. So the moral of the story is, even if you think you're sure, just double check, go test it, go do some dry runs of the battle against yourself. Halloween certainly did more of this in the run up to this battle than I did, and the end result reflects that. So that is it for the Semper Gumby Q&A. I know there's some questions I haven't addressed directly, but hopefully their subject matter has gotten some attention. There was quite a bit of overlap, and of course the whole thing is like some kind of interrelated spaghetti bundle. Halloween, if you're watching this and you have any thoughts you want to add in a comment, I'll make sure to pin it so it's at the top. And with that, we are leaving this map for a little while. Uh, we are going to be coming back to it. The Few Good Men's Operation Five Lions multiplayer campaign has finally come to a close. It is definitely something I want to share with you guys and this map features quite heavily so we will be seeing it again. Until then though, thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed this, uh, found it interesting and I'll catch you in the next video.